Hello and welcome everyone to tonight's events at 192 Books. Uh, I am Evan, the manager here at 192, and I'm really thrilled to welcome everyone to celebrate the upcoming release of Robert Storer's Writing on Art, 1980-2005 from Penny Publishing. Um, this collection is the first of two sets coming out and it collects reviews, essays, and um, articles throughout Robert Storer's um, career, focusing on a wide range of artists and art movements. And um, it's just a sort of essential collection um, for art lovers everywhere. So we're really thrilled to be joined tonight by Robert Storer and the editor of this collection, Francesca Pietro Paola. Um, they're going to talk about this book and about Robert's career and you know anything they really want to. <laughs> and after that, we'll take questions from you, the audience. So if you have a question, you can send it to the email below, evan at 192 books, and I will uh, join everyone later to ask them those questions. So if you have a question now, feel free to send it. If you have a question at any point during the conversation, send it over. The earlier you ask, the better chance you'll get to hear it tonight. So yeah, send them early and often. If you don't know already, Francesco Pietropola is a Italian uh, art historian, curator, and critic. She's worked before at MoMA, the Walker Center, um, Fondizione de Venezia. Um, she writes for Art in America, uh, Brooklyn Rail, Art News, and many other places. Um, and Robert Storr is a artist, critic, and curator, also been a chief curator at MoMA. Uh, Dean of the School of Art at Yale. He's a frequent contributor to, or contributing editor actually at Art in America, uh, frequent contributor to Art Forum, Broken Rail, uh, Freeze, many great places, and the author of numerous catalogs, including most recently, Philip Gustin, A Life Spent Painting. So uh, without any further ado, I am going to hand it over to Francesca and Robert, and I hope everyone enjoys. Thanks so much for joining us. I guess we're on. We're on. Good evening and thank you, Evan. And thank you to nine, 192 Books and Paul Cooper Gallery for hosting this conversation. And thank you to everybody who's attending, connected with us, with Rob and I uh, online. And I'm very happy to be with Rob to celebrate the release of uh, his um, book of writings, which range from the years uh, 1980 to 2005. So it's the first of a two volume collection of his brilliant writings. And um, I think I can show you the book again. So um, should I say, Rob, a little bit about the book and then we can start off talking or? No means, please. So this book came um, uh, into being, you know, really was stemmed from the desire to gather for the very first time some of Rob's uh, most important texts. So it's a selection out of a much larger pool. Um, this first volume uh, comprises 45 texts. So there are articles, reviews, essays. So it's interesting also to, um, to read, you know, different formats of uh, critical writing. And um, I think um, one of the most uh, interesting elements of uh, Rob's critical output is uh, that you can see his exploration, especially with the chronological sequence through which the texts are presented in this volume, that there is this um, growing over time um, interest in really an exceptional range of international artists and uh, really some of the most influential artists of the 20th and the 21st century. But he also tackles in very um, insightful ways, topics and perspectives that I feel like very urgent still today, very timely, uh, such as issues of race, identity, gender, uh, censorship, and also the possibilities and the challenges of public art. And uh, he's also very self-reflective about his own process of writing in the text. And um, through some of the, the essays, particularly an essay on Clement Greenberg and then an article on Maya Shapiro, we also see Rob's uh, you know, analysis about the role of the art critic and of the art 
historian. So I guess maybe to start off our conversation, Rob, I'd like to ask you, how does it feel to see your writing in this first chapter, you know, first of a two volume collection uh, together? What's, uh, what's the thoughts that spring from there and this sort of retrospective look on it? Well, it's something that I didn't anticipate, uh, that I rather dreaded. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it would not have happened had you not been willing to take on the lion's share of the work and had you not persuaded me that it was worthwhile doing. So I'm deeply in your debt for this. I've said in numerous contexts that this is really your book. And as far okay. as I'm concerned, it really is your book. I wrote the stuff that's in it, but you made it a book and you made it uh, an intelligible collection of essays. And without that, it wouldn't wouldn't be that interesting, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one thing that we thought we could do this evening was to uh, show some of the images from the book, just sort of as though we were turning some of the pages with you, and that to give a sense of that incredible range of style, generation of artists that Rob's uh, addresses, um, but also to make it lively and as though we were more present instead of just online. So let me see if I can first share the images. There we go. So I wanted Rob to show you in your MoMA office. I believe this is in the late 1990s because you were working at the time on the Chuck Close catalog. Yes. And I love this picture because it shows uh, just just sort of the process and, and the environment in which you work. And we were talking even earlier before connecting about this wonderful piling up of books that is sort of a feature of your different um, studios and offices. Well, this is, this is, this is kind of how I am. It's, <laughs> it's a sedimentation of things that have come my way. Sometimes I've sought them out, but mostly they have come my way. And when you work at a place like MoMA, people are always sending you catalogs. So you keep the ones you want to keep and you set aside the ones you don't. Um, but this this was the office that I had from the time I was at uh, MoMA in the beginning until the time I became a senior curator. So I and I remember one time Michael Ovitz came into this office looking for the hotshot Robert Stork and couldn't believe that I had an office this size that was this crowded. And I mean, it's, it's sort of, it was sort of good actually. It was a lesson to him that you know big shots don't necessarily have big shot offices, or maybe <laughs> big shots maybe they're just very busy people. That's all. <laughs> And then here I show you the cover of the book again, so that you can also, you know, just look at the different list of artists. And uh, the other very interesting aspect of the book is that, you know, we see how you tackle, you know, modern artists as well as uh, contemporary artists. And I think uh, um, some of your first articles that you wrote um, starting in 1980 for the New Art Examiner, the magazine based in Chicago, they already show that you had an interest beyond, you know, the, the American art scene. We, in particular, we chose um, a review of an Aldo Rossi show mm -hmm. and um, in Boston when you were living there at the time. And then um, a very interesting review on Anne and Patrick Poirier of a show that they had um, that year at the Carpenter Center of Visual Arts. So maybe it would be interesting, Rob, if you could tell us also how you started out. You have this wonderful foreword in the book that you title The Accidental Critic. So if you could tell us how you you sometimes say you don't you didn't go from A to Z, but you sort of had a path that wasn't like a building career, which I think is is pretty unique. Well, it may sound disingenuous to some people listening to it from the outside, but I honestly didn't think that I was going to have a career as such. I've always thought that the essence to having an interesting life is having good work. And so the work that I chose was the, the thing that then shaped itself into something people call a career. But I uh, initially didn't want to write criticism. I'm a painter. I started out as a painter. I will end as a painter. Um, maybe not a very well-known one, but that's fine with me. Um, and uh, when I was in Boston, my wife, who's a musician, and I uh, 
got ourselves a situation in Boston where basically we were butler and maid to a, uh, a Harvard residence, and we would cook also. So we were we were living upstairs above the above the the house, and then we just sort of did that, and we had practically no income, but we lived comfortably. And um, I took the job with with the New York Examiner because at that time I had some loose time because I didn't have a full day work, and I thought sure why not. And so I took it on, even though I was not keen to be a critic, and I resisted in the past. Um, and that gave me some experience sort of on the job training. Um, when I came to New York, um, I did not intend to be a critic. And in fact, I'd had that experience in Boston. I thought, that's enough of that, thank you. Um, and I <laughs> did a, an angry letter to the editor, which is something I do from time to time. Um, and it was an edit to the editor of the Village Voice. And it was a protest about something that Peter Sheldahl had written about Philip Guston. And it was long, as also as my something, my weakness or tendency, I don't know which, but it was long. And so nothing happened. I didn't expect anything. I was at that time being a carpenter and a sheet rocker. Um, so Peter very graciously wrote back and said, uh, Robert Store, I don't know who you are. Uh, this <laughs> letter is way too long to publish, but there's some things that are interesting in it. Uh, and so can we meet? And so we met at, um, uh, at Mickey Ruskin's last bar down on, um, I forget where it was exactly, but uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a pretty fancy watering hole for me. Uh, and, uh, and he invited me to come become the second critic at the Village Voice, and this was like 1981 or two, I think. And I said, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. I didn't want to do that. And he was completely perplexed by my having made that decision. Uh, he was, I think he was hurt that I didn't uh, thank him for the opportunity and just run with the ball. It was based, in fact, on only one letter to the other. I had not written anything substantial at that time. So I said, no, thank you. Uh, he was miffed, but he had the good grace to uh, send that letter to Betsy Baker at Art in America and recommend that she hire me for the back of the book reviews. And that's what I did. I did take that because that was a small amount of writing. It was not too prominent. It was not like being in The Voice every week where people wanted to know what you thought and where you were already taking a power position in the art world. And that was my apprenticeship was in America. It was more than an apprenticeship, but it was great. So you learned on the job, right? As a creator. And through their, you know, a careful editing, I guess, you know, work with, the, with yeah. them as well. Art in America was a, a very well edited magazine from every point of view in terms of the selection of who to write about. I mean, I chose my own artists. I wasn't dictated who to write about, but they were, they had people they were more interested and less interested in. Um, and then of course there was Joan Simon, who was my other immediate hands on it. Mm. And Joan taught me a great deal. Peter taught me quite a lot too. He was very strict about not writing in the passive voice. And I have never forgotten that. <laughs> I do it sometimes, but I'm aware when I do it, I'm aware that that's a liability. Uh huh. <laughs> Rob, as you talked about letter writing, you know, also in a polemical way as a start off of your, um, you know, way into our criticism, I just uh, thought I can read from your foreword, just the beginning of it, a few lines. Um, you write, I served my apprenticeship in our criticism, writing letters. This practice began in notes to a distant relative, my maternal great aunt, living in New York City, who starting in 1968, when I was 18, gave me the grand tour of the Manhattan Heart World. And I think I can show her right here. She's second from left standing, and then next to her, first from right, uh, among the other women in the picture, there's Gertrude Stein. Would you talk a little bit about her, Elizabeth Chapman, and uh, the importance that she had in your formative years? Well, I met her the year before, uh, you know, I, I, I met her before I, I really knew her. And then I knew her from 18 till she died. Um, but I met her in 17 when I was on my way to France, to a school in France where I was just trying to get away from, you know, what was going on in this country at that time. I was draft age um, and all of that. So she, she was, a, she had married well, as they say in those days. Uh, and so she had money. And she was extremely curious and energetic and sometimes uh, um, aggressive person. <laughs> um, she was also very nice to me, very, very nice to me. So she took me under her wing. She knew I was interested in art. I knew I was interested in art. 
and she took me under her wing and I would come in from, from Philadelphia where I was in college and she would put me up for a night and she would take me around to all the shows in town. I mean, all of them in those days. It was 57th Street plus a little tiny bit, Paula Cooper, in fact. Uh, in ah. Soho. Um, and we would do the rounds. She had a driver. And I would just, I would go with her and she would just take me around. And she'd take me to museum shows and so on. I saw things I would never have seen otherwise. Um, and uh, she was a Republican, a staunch Republican. I most certainly was not. And so we had to negotiate that, but we did. And she was she was very good about it. And her husband at that time, Guy Chapman, was even more so. I remember one time she said, if you will vote for Jimmy Carter, I'll never talk to you again. <laughs> <laughs> and after she left the room, he just looked at me and said, don't worry about it. It's okay. <laughs> so... I, early on, I understood that in the art world, you have to sort of uh, not hide your politics, but you can't put them out in front of you all the time. It, mm -hmm. you know, it's just the people who are disagree with you and nothing at the same time. So, um, you know, that was that was good. That was a great education. Yeah. Just, and, you know, and she took you to parties where you met some of the most uh, important artists like Christo and Jean-Claude and others, right? The first party I went to with her was at Bill Rubin's loft downtown. I think it was in the early wow. teens um, of uh, the city and uh, off Fifth Avenue. And in one night I met Jasper Johns, uh, Christo Jean-Claude, Patty and uh, Klaus Oldenburg, um, uh, George, uh, George um, Siegel. Wow. Uh, well, so there were a lot of people and I met them all. I'd heard of a few of them, but I didn't really know who they were. And I wasn't over impressed by any of them, although I was interested in all of them. So it was a kind of nice introduction because I wasn't starstruck, but I was intensely interested. And then the one who sort of made the evening for me was Lee Krasner. And Lee Krasner was there and she was fending off people who wanted to buy her husband's paintings, as to say, Jackson Pollock's paintings. Uh, and she wanted attention for herself, not for him. And uh, she also knew that she could use me as a pawn in her game. So uh, I was her walker for much of the evening. And whenever somebody came too close and pushed too hard, she would stick me in front of her and then order me another drink. So that was the beginning of my habit of drinking at openings, which was uh, <laughs> I was able to manage, but just barely. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Rob, I'd like to show some of the artists that you wrote, uh, some of the most interesting article early on in the 80s when you started working uh, as a critic for Art in America. There's Louise Bourgeois. This is the distraction of the father. And then this is jumping to your um, 1991 exhibition at MoMA, these locations where you um, invited different artists like Louise, Bruce Nauman, David Hammonds, Adrian Piper, Chris Bird, and Sophie Kao to make new works, new installations uh, for the museum. So this is a pivotal moment in your career as well, or in your path in terms of um, joining the museum world, right? And um, it was at the invitation of Kirk Barnado that you started working at MoMA. But I remember you telling me about this beautiful story, asking advice to different people. And one of the advices that um, I guess mattered to you most was from Felix Gonzalez Torres, right? Right. I asked him, I asked Leon Gallup, I asked a lot of my friends on the left, what happens if I go into that world? What will happen to me? And part of my concern was the question only I could answer was what would happen to me as an artist? But the other one was what happens if I go into the belly of the beast? What happens to uh, the, the person they knew who was a member of the, 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 you know, the radical art community if I joined MoMA? And Felix was the best answer. He said, that'd be great. They'll have one of us inside. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. And this is the installation to some that Louise realized on that occasion. And then just to show, you know, your writing really um, puts the reader in touch with the arts of very different artists and in particular within the field of painting. So here we are with you and Philip Perlstein and one of Philip's paintings appearing in the book, but also Peter Saul. Here you are at the opening of the Whitney, I think, um, with Peter and Sarah Canwright, another friend of yours, an artist that you write about very early on. And here's a painting, a great painting by Peter. I met Peter at Skowhegan. And ah. 
we started arguing almost immediately, and we've been arguing ever since. <laughs> it's not always been comfortable, but it's been it's been tolerable. And he's very interesting to argue with. He, he does not follow the logic that most people who have a discourse follow. He he has his own uh, he has his own beacon, and he's he's very funny. Uh, and in terms of some of the other, and Phil Perlstein is somebody I met in in Skowhegan also. But uh-huh. I also, when I when I was a painter early on, I was a figurative painter. So I admired his work in an enormous amount. And so much, much later, um, I was instrumental in acquiring two paintings for the museum. One was this very early painting that he did, which was a painting of Superman, which he did before Andy. Oh, yeah. And Andy was his war- his roommate for a while. But uh, Philip was a strange dude then and is a strange dude now. And he, he was an early, early pop artist in a way. Um, so I, I wanted to do something with him later on. So when I was at the studio school with an opportunity to do that, we did a show of his drawings. So I, I, okay. sort of, I do not believe that there are dominant modes in any given period. There are more or less interesting people in more or less established genres or modes. And then there are always the new ones. So I'm interested in the ones that break the ice during a period where there seems to be a very clear definition of style or tendencies. And I'm interested in the ones who excel in the ones that we know and break new ground. And then this is uh, Tilted Ark by Richard Serra. And there's uh, this great article that you wrote in 85, which we included in the book. Um, so it was uh, four years after the work was installed. It was made in 1981. And at that time you were you assessed the, the debate, which was a very heated controversy. And then the work would be unfortunately removed uh, later on in in 89. But I feel like also your interest in public art and the relationship, you know, between art and and the general public and the and the lived um, uh, environment of every day is something that has interested you from early on. There's another really thoughtful article that you wrote um, a decade later in the 1990s on this uh, wonderful a monument that Rachel White read, um, conceived and then realized after a very difficult moment with the politics there in Austria, and it's the Holocaust Memorial in Judenplatz in, in Vienna. So um, I think these issues about public art, again, you know, it's great possibilities, but also its challenges or limitations, and then the political debate that can grow around it and against it it's something that you know we're we're also living today although in a different perspective um so i wanted to ask you also some of your thoughts about um that relationship between public art and political reality today particularly around the notion of the monument and what happened with the ongoing movement for uh, racial justice in, in the U.S. Well, I think- and in, Euro- and in Europe, in some parts of Europe also. I think public art is the most difficult category in which to make art. And mm-hmm. it is disparaged by almost everybody when it first shows up. And then after a while, some of it lasts and some of it doesn't. But yeah. the, the art that lasts tends to be as controversial as the art that's no good. The difference between the two of them is that the art that lasts is the art that creates interesting conversation, interesting debate, interesting controversy. And the artist has to think in terms of that. How do they, what what of the parameters that they control as artists, how do you foster the most intelligent controversy about Mm. and about art, uh, rather than having people scrap over something that doesn't make much difference uh, to most of the people who are engaged in it. Uh, The Sarah was 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 a tragedy, frankly. You know, this was a really good piece, and yeah. it should have stayed where it was. And there was a great deal of sniping that came from the art world that said he was a fool to do it, or that uh, it wasn't a good piece out of all of his work and so on. Although I was very critical of how he conducted himself in the controversy, because he mm-hmm. said needlessly hostile things and, and antagonistic things towards those who just plain didn't understand him. I, I defended to the very last that it should remain there. And it's too bad if you go by this plaza now, you see there's nothing there except, you know, what they call amenities in, in architectural terms. Which yeah, is yeah. A great piece. It was a great piece and is a great piece, wherever it is. 
And then uh, Elizabeth Murray is one of the artists that you championed from early on. And uh, we chose an article that you wrote on her in 86 that was published in Parquet. And I think that also shows how gradually you become also a critic whose voice is uh, uh, heard and highly respected internationally, starting in Europe in particular. So with Parquet in Zurich, and then you'll be starting a long standing uh, writing relationship uh, with the um, French magazine, the Parisian magazine, our press. Um, well, for a while, I would try things out either at Art Press or at Parquet or both. And I would try things out that I couldn't find an audience for in this country. And yeah. so, um, you know, there was a time, and it wasn't very long ago, when Elizabeth Murray was thought of as being just a second rate. Uh, yeah. And you cannot imagine how disparaging people were, even though the work was so fabulous. And at that time, there was a mainstream and people believed fervently in it. They believed that if you weren't in it, you were not in the game at all. They believed that if you looked like anybody who was notably in it, then you were just an influenced disciple of. And, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of writing about Elizabeth, I did it against a lot of opposition. And I put her in the Venice Biennale, partly because I thought that that was work that still needed to be done, partly because yeah. her international reputation had suffered by being dealt with in this disparaging way. So I thought, of all the women artists that you could you know, back, there were many of them who made work about being women, and that was Nancy was one of them. But there were those who made work about other things who were equally uh, you know, disparaged and put down just by virtue of the fact that they're women. I think that's different now, but it's not as different as it should be. If you look at the numbers in exhibitions of women compared to men, in the same way if you look at the number of African Americans or Hispanic Americans or whatever in exhibitions, it's still predominantly guys like me. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to show also the work of Nancy Spiro, because as you were mentioning, she's an artist that you wrote about, you know, early on. And it's it's about your interest in, in the work of women artists and feminism, which is something that it's, it's, it's a very strong thread, I think, through your writings. And uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how that has come um, into playing in, in your own thinking and uh, and in your own criticism, the, the importance of feminism that I think is spread starting from some very direct personal relationships, right? I, I grew up in a, in a quite matriarchal setup and I was looked after by two women who were a couple, who ran a bookstore and one of them taught me to read because I was very, very slow to read. Um, when I came into the art world, I fell into the company of uh, Kate Horsfield and and, um, and um, I'm just blanking on her name, but I choose a very dear friend, so that's really bad. Lynn, uh, video data banks later, right? I apologize to Lynn's ghost, but anyway, Lynn Blumenthal and Kate Horsfield took me under their wing, gave me things to do for the video data bank, and I learned an enormous amount from them. And then I've always just had more friends among women than I had among men. Men are not that much fun to talk to because they're so busy trying to win the argument. So. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I, f I found in Nancy's work some very, very compelling stuff all on its own. But it also was very striking to me that as the conversations in the 80s were about politics, about feminism, and about text, she was just not given that much room because she just was not cool. She was not doing things that were phonomechanical. She did them with an old bulletin typewriter. The texts were not texts that sounded like theory. Actually, they were writing in this case, Antonin Artaud, she was, she was doing all the things she was supposed to be doing according to the dominant critical uh, school, but she yeah. didn't do the way she was supposed to do. And so she also was shunted off to the side. And that just riled me up and that made me want to you know, defend her all the more. And then you also write about Louise Lohler um, early on. And this is a wonderful photograph by her uh, part of the Tremaine series from the uh, collection of the Tremaines. And I think it's it's one of the works that you love, particularly of hers, right? It is. It's this. And the other one is of a painting, a protractor painting of Frank Stella's reflecting in the polyurethane floor, which is, if ever there was, an aura. Now, the point was that Louise was at the heart of this postmodernist theory group, um, but she was not of it entirely. 
And what she did was she actually provided all the visual information and all the actually, you know, other kinds of information you needed. But she wasn't making art that illustrated these points. She was making art that grew out of a parallel understanding of the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, of art that was, uh, you know, not art that was material culture rather than art. OK, so here you, here you have a politic rhyming with a soup terrine. And it's not a put down of the pollock, and it's not an elevation of the soup terrine. It's about the uncanny way in which these two things actually belong in the same image. And when they enter into our heads, if we don't recognize that there's a discrepancy here, we're not paying attention. And she does by showing with the eyes. Now, opticality was supposed to be everything in certain parts of the 50s, and then it was absolutely the enemy of everything later on when the anti-aesthetic came in. Well, here's a highly sophisticated person looking at things and extracting information, contradictions, everything. And then Susan Rothenberg. And uh, we did include um, a 1990 essay that you wrote for the catalog of her exhibition in, in Malmo in Sweden. But I just wanted to point out that when you wrote a wonderful article in 1983 for Art in America, it was noticed in Paris. And that's how you were first invited to start writing for the Art Press magazine, right? And it was through one of the advisor, Miriam Salomon. Yeah, this was also my first article for Art in America, and it was commissioned by Joan Simon. I worked with her. She then wrote a very good book on Susan, which I hope is still in print, but it's well worth looking at. And since Susan has just died, it's a good time to re-examine her career since she was somebody who had a great moment, who had an extended career, but hasn't had the kind of attention she deserves. But anyway, I, I wrote this as my first, my, my debut article as opposed to a review, and we stayed friends for, for, till the end of her life. Yeah. And then you wrote on Basquiat as well, on the occasion of his Robert Miller Gallery show in 1990. And then I, I just wanted to discuss with you, um, you know, the, the notion of, of censorship. You edited, um, together with Barbara Ackman, I think, uh, in two issues of our journal on art censorship and the First Amendment. And uh, in this particular issue, you were, um, you know, responding to the attack that, in particular, Hilton Kramer had uh, done um, on Robert Mapperthor that was being shown at the time. Uh, can you talk about that and maybe other forms of uh, censorship that today are maybe coming sometimes from institutions, not just from uh, criticism of, or from uh, government agencies? Okay, well, I'm of a generation when things like Fanny Hill and Lady Chatterley's Lover and John Ritchie and who else were just being published for the first time without legal impediments. So mm -hmm. categorically in the First Amendment right to publish and to say anything. And I think in the present context, we have both conservatives who don't want things to be said and people who belong to the left who think it's unfair and unkind to say things. I think you just say them to whomever will listen and you let the, the situation sort itself out. Free expression is not something that you can, uh, you can hem in by good conduct medals and by outright uh, prohibition. I think the thing is, to, to like, I'm not a big fan of Robert Maplethorpe. And I think Len Ligon's critique of Robert Maplethorpe in his work is appropriate. But he is, an artist, he is an artist who has a certain standing and the fact that he was sort of demonized the way he was. And it wasn't just Hilton Kramer, it was Helen Frankenthaler. Artists turned against him, artists mm -hmm. turned him. So I think this whole episode was one of the, the sorriest uh, periods of American uh, cultural politics, but it's coming back. So we'll have to deal with it all over again. Yeah. And here um, I'm, I'm showing um, an installation by Adrian Piper that she realized uh, for these locations at MoMA again. And there's also a wonderful foreword that you wrote for her collection of writings that came out in the 90s, in the 1960s, that we want we included in the book. So I feel like she's also an artist that you've been watching closely for for a long time until today. And then I just wanted to show David Hammond's uh, wonderful work that he made for the same um, exhibition. 
And uh, recently, I think it was um, uh, Holland Carter in the New York Times the past summer that remembered, you know, this piece um, in relation to the current debate in the U.S. And, you know, the, the photo uh, mural in the middle it reproduces the equestrian statue of uh, Theodore Roosevelt on, with a, a Native American man and a, an African man on the side of his horse that was recently removed from the entrance of the Museum of Natural History in New York. It just strikes me, you know, to go back to these images from the 1990s and see how so many, you know, deeply difficult and disturbing issues, you know, were being addressed by an artist and, and are still something that we are grappling with with today. I think it also speaks of the fact that you were bringing in into the museum at the time, you know, often very challenging in, a, in an interesting way, challenging contemporary art, you know, in, in this um, sort of temple of, of, of modernism. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about the installation of that piece and how it came into being and the process of the artist? I think he, he had different options set out, as you explain in the essay for that catalog, and it was further, like closer to installation that he set on this particular work. Well, this is a piece that David didn't actually care for very much once he made it. Oh. But I, 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 I love it, and I think it's also newly apropos because of this new reconsideration of what this monument is. But uh, he was unhappy with it. I don't quite know why, but I also know that until that time, he'd never worked with a budget. And he had always made things out of practically nothing in places that had no uh, you know, standing. Um, and so when we offered him a budget, and it wasn't very much, I think it was $10,000 for everything, to make an installation, uh, you know, it was, it was sort of throw him off his stride. But it came out, this was at the time of Desert Storm, uh, mm. the, the war in the Middle East. And so he was trying to sort of create something combining a demonstration atmosphere, like with the police lines and their little tanks and their airplanes attached to the ceiling and so on. And then he went outside and gathered a lot of fall leaves and scattered them on the floor, which oh, freaked yeah. the museum out more than the piece because they were afraid of the bugs that might come in with the, with the leaves. But in any case, we got through it all right. Um, and there's something in the, in the piece that you can't see in the photograph, but uh, it, it is that when this was installed, it dissolved the windows. It looks like it looked like the indoors of leaves and whatever it was in the green wall, mm -hmm. a continuation of the space outdoors, which is the fall garden at MoMA. So it was a very, very effective use of Philip Johnson's no longer extant um, galleries on the third floor. Yeah. And then you also uh, write about Martin Perrier, just yes. to show the different artists that you are interested in. And okay. then with the um, Art Spiegelman's uh, Mouse Projects show, I think it was really the first time that comics was brought into a museum um, setting, right? Well, it was the first time that comics were brought into MoMA as the subject rather than as, a, as an item of interest on the side. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason that Art Spiegel was willing to do it because uh, he had been included, but in the, the, in a kind of in a way that he thought wasn't doing the the art form any uh, favors uh, in high and low. And of course, the comics had been included in many many museum shows, but this was a show about the making of a comic strip or a comic book really, uh, and both volumes of it. So, and it was it was it was it was an important thing to do at that time because. First of all, the book was fresh and new. Second, because it was a corrective, if you will, to the flaws of high and low, which I don't think was as bad as many people did, but there were certainly things about it that had to be questioned. And it was doing institutional critique from inside MoMA, not a hostile retort to Kirk, who I think tried his best to do something uh, well, but rather it was a kind of a corrective to lapses. And it was a way in which the museum could in fact kind of heal itself by doing things that it had overlooked. And here I just wanted to show this great picture from your archives uh, with uh, Bruce Nauman at the time of his uh, exhibition in the 90s and uh, with Harald Zeman in the picture as well. 
and anthrosocial. This is not the installation view from these locations at MoMA, but from a recent presentation at Fondation Cartier in Paris. Can I can I add a show uh, a comment about this one? This sure. The man Randy Randy Eckhart uh, shouting, "Help me, hurt me, sociology, feed me, eat me, anthropology," and it's loud. Now it was a room which was the antechamber to Ilya Kabakov's installation, which was of an entirely different nature. And he was initially quite uncomfortable, I think, with the fact that there was so much noise and you had to walk through to get to his space. And then he very, very kind of wryly said, well, it's not so different from the Soviet Union. You you go someplace, you wait in line, and somebody yells at you. So that was the... <laughs> but anyway, his piece was great, too. And then we go into the realm of Rudy Burkhardt with this wonderful photograph of New York, of Times Squares in the in the 30s. So again, just to show also your interest across media, which I think is really remarkable. I mean, you have uh, clearly an incredible perceptiveness in your writing for painting, being also a painter, but uh, your interest really ranges widely from photography to performance to film uh, installation art comics that we've seen and and so on and this is the first uh, panel of a triptych by the african artist cherry samba uh, you wrote for a catalog essay for the fondation cartier in in paris and he's also one of the artists that you included in the 2007 venice biennale and i just wanted to read a little passage from your book, because um, I think it also shows the importance of description, you know, as part of your writing uh, method. And so starting from the works of art and their experience of them. So you write from your catalog essay on him, Samba portrays himself at a table strewn with African masks and other artifacts uh, next to one where Pablo Picasso sits pencil in one hand poised above a gridded tablecloth, which may be read as a fully abstract permutation of cubism. Here the text reads, what future for our art? And goes on to reason that only acceptance in France will free it from the culture ghetto in which it languishes, that whoever says France in this context says the Museum of Modern Art, and then bluntly punctuates the chain of propositions with the question, well, yes, but isn't the Museum of Modern Art racist? So again, an interest in, in issues of uh, race and identity, but also, um, you know, a wonderful, insightful way of bringing to a general public, bringing to its attention the work of um, artists that at the time were not so much into the mainstream narrative of, of contemporary art, right, Rob? Yeah, and thanks to a collector, uh, I was able to get a very good Sherry Samba into the collection. Mm -hmm. Several works by African artists that I brought in. Um, and so even as it was a small part of what I was doing as a curator, it was a substantial and sustained part. And something that I wanted to point out is uh, that by bringing together these writings, even in just this first volume with a certain time frame, so from the 80s to the first half of the 2000s, one can see that, you know, the world of art is really plural, also in the sense of, of cultural uh, elements. And so, you know, there's, of course, at the heart of your reflections, American art, but from early on, as we've seen with the Poirier uh, article or the review on Aldo Rossi, a particular attention to this other side of the Atlantic, to European art. So there are artists like Immendorf, uh, uh, Richter, Sophie Kahl, and many, many others. And also Latin American artists, uh, which I think is something you developed um, when you started working at MoMA, making trips to different countries in Latin America, but also particularly on African um, artist. Uh, so I'm thinking of Cherry Samba, but also in our second volume on which we're working right now, and which will be out, we think, next fall. There's uh, Malik Sidibe, uh, Seydou Keita, Ella Natsui, that you also included in your Venice Biennale. And I wanted to show a great picture of Malik Sidibe, the photographer, 
who in Venice uh, was the first recipient of a Golden Lion for Life achievement, right? And it was the first time for a photographer and the first time for an African artist. So I just uh, wanted to ask you about this um, interest and how it came about for uh, art from, from Africa. Well, the, the simplest explanation is just biographical. I grew up on the south side of Chicago in a racially mixed community. At the time I did my MoMA shows for the first 10 years, I was living in Flatbush, which was mostly Afro-Caribbean. Um, I have never lived in a place that was lily white, although many people seem to think that that's where I come from. I am not to the manner born. I am not lily white. And I just don't get it that people can't look at the range of things being made by people of color and find some something exciting to see and that they can't stretch their imaginations to figure out why a person they have never met from a culture that they don't know made this remarkable thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the case of Marik, it was a very happy occurrence in another way. Um, there was a woman named Monique Bobby Bouvier, who was a great collector of modernism and, and lived in Switzerland. And, but she also had a collection of African art. She knew uh, uh, all these artists and she uh, was a patron of a project in Mali to write songs in all the different tribal languages of the, uh, of the country, which is a huge country, um, about how to deal with AIDS. And so the, the lyrics were written by doctors, but the tunes and the way they were put together as music were done by local musicians and they did it from traditional instruments to Afro pops, modern stuff and so on. Anyway. And the deal was that there was going to be a competition and that the best of these songs would be made a national event. And Monique underwrote it and Monique took a picture of every one of the contestants and the finalists. So he was in my exhibition with those pictures. And then I had one prize to give away on my own volition only. And I thought, okay, let's just break another barrier. Let's get a photographer in here as a photographer. They'd had photographers in as sculptors, but they'd never had them as photographers. And let's just get Malik in here as an African artist who had done extraordinary work. So that was that. Yeah. Was I just love this picture of Malik uh, with his um, camera around his neck. I, I just think it's so great. And then I know you love this particular photograph that shows you in Venice when you were leaving there with, with your family during the preparation of the Venice Biennale. And uh, I think I'll let you describe it. There, there's like this contradiction exploding in the picture, right? Caught between the church and the Communist Party. <laughs> the largest vestiges of the old Italian Communist Party is its headquarters, which is right on the corner, right behind the Arsenale. And I would pass this place daily. And I don't know who took this picture anymore. It was, I think, a, 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 um, a Swiss, but anyway. Uh, yeah, a photographer, a professional photographer that we had met. I didn't know it. I was just asked to walk up and down, whatever. But uh, that's where we took this picture. And I just like it because it has sort of a lot of elements. I am not a Christian, but I do respect people who, uh, you know, believe in what the Sermon on the Mount says. I am not a communist, but I do respect the people who understand what the Communist Manifesto is about. And generally speaking, I think uh, if you lift the ideological constraints of both of those and other kinds of schools of thought, and just look at the world with the best wisdom that any and every one of them offers. That's also pluralism. Uh, people may say it's eclecticism, but it's just basically being awake and alive. Oops, and then I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, you wrote this wonderful article, The Scholar Artist on Mayor Shapiro in 87, when there was a survey up at Columbia of his uh, work um, as an artist of his works on paper. And um, I, I think uh, in my mind, there's, there's a lot in common that you have with his uh, methodology. And I think the fact that you value the artistic process and, and you understand it from within and bring it at the center in, in art historical as well as political writing is really key to, to your voice, to the uniqueness of your voice. Um, could you say a little bit about that? And just to show Meyer Shapiro's work in terms of figurative drawings and then other paintings. Meyer was somebody who I knew not that well, but I knew well enough. And I met at the Modern a couple of times and we did have some conversations and I did write about him, but I knew about him much more than I knew him. And I think that his way of handling a highly sophisticated understanding of artistic formal issues, and he mm -hmm. was 
medieval art more so than of modern art, but he was a, a scholar of modern art too and a friend of a lot of artists. Um, that, that, that coupled with his politics, which he, which he never let go of, you know, and he was a member of the American left, the Trotskyist left. And so I, I just respected it a lot. The other critic who probably influenced me the most was Leo Steinberg, who was mm -hmm. also a complex mixture of a critical mind and a maker. He was a very good draftsman. And we used to have dinner together. And uh, I, I, I learned an enormous amount about uh, many things from him. And then I wanted to jump, if it allows me to, yeah. Well, Philip Gaston, I feel like it's really one of the central artists that um, you come back to over the years. So in our book, we don't have a particular monographic article on him, but it's really an important um, reference through different essays and articles. And I just uh, would love to read um, very briefly from your Nancy Spiro essay uh, in the book, um, what you write about Gaston's work. Rather than pointing his finger at his brutish Cuckoo's Klansmen as if they were a remote or alien nemesis, Gaston, draping the artist in a hood as well, was pointing at himself. America had met the enemy, and it was us. Now, I just wanted you to uh, to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the importance of Gaston for you. I think sometimes you've uh, talked about him as uh, the most complete artist of his generation, maybe to uh, point at the complexity of his work and the contradictions that he brings out. And um, we know that there was a very heated controversy about the canceling of uh, the planned retrospective coming up that is now uh, planned for 2022. So if you could say briefly something about that, and maybe we can then uh, talk about it when we open it to questions, which we should do pretty soon. Well, I wrote about Gustin when I was living in Cambridge. Um, I uh, disagreed with Peter about Gustin, um, but that also drove me to want to think more about him. And I wrote my first book about Gustin in 1986. And Gustin has all that it takes for me to be really interested. Um, and it was that he was uh, sort of at the at the the crossing point of stylistic differences. He he longed for a pure disengaged abstraction, and he made it for a while. But he also liked figuration and he was very good at it. He also mm -hmm. liked to mix humor with tragedy. He was, uh, you know, he was a full quotient of the contradictions, as you say, of what makes a modern person. And he was a master of what I deem to be the single dominant element of uh, contemporary art, which is the grotesque, which is the, the presence of all these elements in a, a unitary way in a given work of art but in, in a way that also reminds you of where the points of division and fracture exist. And he was just an amazing artist, and he is inexhaustibly amazing as far as I'm concerned. I don't think I'll write a third book, but I've... <laughs> oh, yes, because your book, uh, Philip Gaston, A Life for Spent Painting, just came out uh, recently, right? Uh, so, I mean, I'll just... I'll just I'll keep thinking about him, and fortunately, I was able to buy a print a couple of years ago, so I, you know, I, I can look at that very hand that appears in the print. It was an edition done for Skowhegan, and I can think about it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> With that, Rob, I think we can uh, uh, take questions from our audience, and I'll try to... Here. I think you just got to do the stop share. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and thank you for that. That was really wonderful to listen to, and it felt like we were flipping the book, through the book together. Um, we've got a couple questions from the audience if you'd like to answer. Um, for the both of you, um, Taylor would, is asking who were some of your early critical influences, uh, like when you began art writing, and then who are some of your people that you look to now uh, in your practice? Okay, um, probably the single most important early one other than Meyer and Leo Steinberg, and Leo Steinberg was even more important to me than Meyer, was uh, Lucy Lepard. And mm -hmm. had a profound influence on my thinking, and I've always 
uh, championed her writing, and I've continued to think that it was, it's not too bad that she moved on from art criticism, but I wish she had double time and could continue to write art criticism as well as do her social and uh, cultural writing. But, you know, that's it. Um, who do I look to now? Um, I read a lot of different people, but I don't have a, a person I'm most favorably uh, involved with. Um, I, I value Lexi Worth. I value uh, Christian Pimeras Fonet. I, I, I read a lot of different people. Who I don't read anymore are the theorists who insist that you bear with them until they get to their point, and then they don't. <laughs> um, for me, I think, well, obviously, Rob, and the reason why it was such a pleasure for me to um, curate this anthology is that someone I really wrote uh, in depth uh, since I was in New York, living and working there in the 2000s. I think your slow burn uh, Carol Dunham article in our forum was one of the first pieces that I read back then. And uh, Leon Steinberg, certainly. And I find a lot of um, things in common between actually Rob and, and Leo Steinberg's writing. Um, also, in particular, just the way with words, this wonderful element um, of the form of writing so that you pause sometimes to reread the sentence as you would do with with fiction or literature, but at the same time, the highly scholarly research that goes into it. And then the personal voice. I think I like that uh, as, a, as a possibility of dialogues with the reader within uh, writing as a form. And then as an Italian historical critical voice, for me, Carla Lonzi with her Autoritratto, the self-portrait from 1969, was really you know, a, a reference in that she critics, uh, the role of the critic and, and the role of, of, of the woman within that field of writing on art, um, you know, with the transparency and the lucidity that really put key things into, into question. And then of the current voices, that there, there are many, and I, I think I really like this great diversity and some of the voices that come through the Brooklyn Rails um, and hyperallergic for me are really, really important to, to read and, and gives a lot of, of uh, uh, food for thought. I would just double underline uh, Tip Dunham because Tip is, uh, in, 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 Carol Dunham, is an infrequent art writer, uh, but he is really good. And yes. I hope he yeah. do it because I wanted to make more paintings, but I, I never miss what he writes. That's true. And David Saal as well, among the artists that have recently published collection of writings. Lady Pixies, he wrote one or two things in the 80s when he was just emerging as an artist, which are memorably good, but his new collection is very, very good. All right. Um, Brett wants to know, Francesca, um, how you sort of made the selections for the collection and if there was anything um, while you were putting it together that you were sort of thrilled to discover and sort of um, put into the collection, maybe something you hadn't realized was, you know, <laughs> you hadn't realized was out there, I guess. Well, as I said at the beginning, there was really a large pool to choose from. I think I counted over 300 packs in the time frame that we were considering, because I also compiled a bibliography that it's at the end of the book that gets to the present. So that gives a an overview of of right of the prolific writing that Rob has done. Um, the selections was really to try to identify the most uh, important and influential texts. And sometimes it was hard. We did this very closely with Rob and some things were really jumping out by themselves sort of. And then others would give more texture. We also, as it's part of the process in an anthology, incurred at one point in having to refine and reduce to have it contained in one volume. So there were some hard choices. Um, and uh, there's, there's, for instance, a wonderful essay that Rob wrote on Barry Leva that I would have loved to have. There are many things, uh, but I think uh, the idea was also to show the different formats in, in the genre of writing. So short reviews, uh, longer, 
monographic articles, um, scholarly essay. And I think because, you know, the wish is also that younger art historians and critics can sort of dive into the book and, you know, just uh, see how different forms of writing have different tones and nature. So it's also very much about that to try to spring a reflection about writing on art in general. All right, and uh, the last question tonight, um, and again for the both of you, but if you could single out one art or uh, artist or artwork that um, felt particularly challenging to write about um, for whatever reason, just something that sort of stretched and, and pushed your abilities, um, that is a question for Maureen. <laughs> I, I tend to write about people that uh, give me a problem, right? Writing about Peter uh, Saul was because I had a problem with him. Uh, we argued, we disagreed. He's not to my taste, but I don't trust taste very much. So part of the issue was to write about somebody who's not instinctively cozy, right? Um, and to write to somebody who's also maybe really challenging intellectually. So I tend to go for things where I have an issue with the artist in question, and the writing is a, is a chance to resolve it to the best of my ability. Um, so, you know, that, that's that's kind of the criteria. I don't have favorite artists. The, the whole thing about being open to this many uh, artists is because no one person does it all for you and no mm -hmm. one does it all for art history either. Artists make what they make uh, and you make of it what you make of it. That's it. Uh, the term that Bakhtin used was dialogic and I think it's, the, it's exactly the right way to go about things in general. So I just want to stop and say that the work that Francesca does is fantastic. Um, she's now in Bari, Italy. She should be in New York. If anybody <laughs> in New York has a job, her, please realize after this, you got on your hands and give her to do here that will allow her to thrive. Because she's lived in New York. She's worked together with me on the Biennale. She's worked at all these other places, but it's a tough time. So, uh, you know, I, I, I will thank be. Thank you, Rob. I'll jump through the screen to thank you. <laughs> But something I just wanted to add briefly is that a fascinating aspect of, of your writing, and I say this for the, you know, for the possible readers of the book, is that it's really about witnessing for the reader this thinking out loud. And I think that that's wonderful. You know, you're starting from the works, from the experience of viewing them or, you know, perceptions, sensations, emotions as well. And, and the reader is taken through this journey of discovery. So you don't have a theoretical discourse that you apply, but it is about dialogue, I guess, with your reaction to the art and then a dialogue that you invite from the reader to make their own judgment as well in the process, I think. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a sentence probably written by Frank O'Hara, but ascribed to uh, Franz Klein, which is being right is an absolutely, pers uh, absolutely a wonderful personal uh, experience that nobody's interested in. <laughs> And then there's a wonderful sense of humor of yours that comes through the writings as well. We, we should say that. <laughs> so it's a fun book too. All right. Well, thank you so much to Robert Story and Francesca uh, for joining us tonight. Um, it was just a pleasure, I think, for me and for everyone watching to uh, be able to be privy to that conversation and um, there will be a recording of this posted right after. So if you'd like to share it or you know someone who missed it, you can send a link along to them. Um, all our past events are available on our website if you ever want to go back and watch them. Um, if you'd like to pre-order the book, we're going to have it here in store when it comes out on the 24th. So just send us an email. You can also order it from our bookshop.org page from the link below. You can't make it over to Chelsea. And we've also gotten stock interviews on our book. It's heavier, but it's <laughs> 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 Gutson book, which is also incredible. We are open every day from 11 to 5 for safe, socially distanced browsing till 6 on Fridays and Saturdays. So please come by when you can. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And have a great night. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>